we're going to study Psalm 133 tonight. And it's our custom to first read the psalm in English and then kind of work through it to have a look at what the Hebrew is saying. And tonight we're going to do something special. We actually, it's not really smell a vision, is it? Because it's not, it's not on TV. But we are going to study the Bible by way of smell, by way of the olfactory sense. So we're going to do a bit of that. And we're also going to study the Bible by way of um, watching visual things as well. So it's going to be an interesting night tonight. What I'm going to do is I've actually asked Errol to read. He had a, an English version from the complete Jewish Bible. And he's going to read that version for us in English. Right, this is the uh, complete Jewish Bible, what's often called the CJB. And the translator of that uh, is Dr. David Stern, a Messianic uh, Jewish believer. Uh, a very scholarly man with a large uh, team behind him uh, in Tel Aviv. Okay, Psalm 133, a song of ascents by David. Oh, how good, how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in harmony. He has fragrant oil on the head that runs down over the beard, and over the beard of Aaron and flows down on the collar of his robes. Uh, it is like the dew of Hermon that settles on the mountains of Tezion, for it was there that Adonai ordained the blessing of everlasting life. Thank you, you're all well read, thank you. Uh, does someone else have another version of the Bible that they'd like to read from? Rav, can you bring the mic over to Teresa? She has the TLV. A song of the saints of David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the, the head, coming down upon the beard, Aaron's beard, coming down on the collar of his robes, it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there Adonai commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Every, every time we do a study, I, I, I try to do a translation from the Hebrew text um, and try to illuminate the fuller meaning of the Hebrew text. We are limited in English as to how we can translate word for word. Um, so I'm going to do that. Before I do that, I'd just like to give you some questions to, to ask yourself. What stands out to me as I hear these words? What stands out to me most? What impacts me most? Is there something in what's said that confuses me and or I have a question about? Is there something in there that God is speaking to me about? And do I have something that I could tell everybody that, hey, I see this. This means a lot to me because it affects me this way. Just keep those things in mind. Also consider this. This psalm is attributed to King David. Okay, It was written at a certain time in history. King David was among a certain people. It refers to very specific things as similes. The oil down Aaron's bed. Well... It's not talking about your mate Aaron from down the road in West Auckland, does it? It talks about locational things, like Mount Hermon. Okay, Mount Hermon is in the land of Israel. It talks about the mountains of Zion. This is the land of Israel. So also keep in mind that this psalm has a contextual, a locational element as well. Okay? A song of that which goes up, that which comes to mind, of degrees, stairs, ascents, attributed to David, whose name means the beloved of God. Behold, now, pay attention, how good and how delightful, pleasant, lovely it is, sitting, dwelling, remaining, abiding, Brothers and sisters, again, also, united, in union, alike, as one. Like oil, the good, the best, on the head, running down, sinking down, marching down, descending on the beard, beard of Aaron. 
whose name can mean the bright one, one of mountains, a light bearer, and art bearer. Running down, sinking down, marching down, descending on the collar of, of his robes. His full stature, the measure of the length of his extent. It is like the dew, the night mist of Hermon. And Hermon means a devoted, devoted uh, mountain. It comes from a word called Haram, which means a devoted thing. Running down, sinking down, marching down, descending on the mountains of Sion. And Sion means parched land. Because there, commands, orders, charges, Hashem, the blessing, prosperity, gift, treaty of peaceful living, perpetual life, going round, Perpetually, as far as forever in the world. Okay, so, I mean, there's a lot of words thrown in there, and it's not a nice, easy read in English, but I've tried to give you as much of the meaning from the original Hebrew as I can, um, and have it flow as best I can. Now we're going to just look through it verse by verse with more of the Hebrew stuff revealed. But before we do that, Keeping all those questions in your head, because we want to talk about it together. Actually, before we, before we watch the, or the visual, let's just take some time to ask you guys, what stands out to you? What confuses you? What did you observe that you think is quite profound? What is it in there that connects you to other scripture? And like I said, put your hand up and we'll get Rav Aliyahu to bring you the microphone. I read the Yaakov's version. <laughs> the, they call it the YHV, Yaakov's heretical version. One of the things that stood out to me was when he, he read the first verse uh, from the Jew, English Jewish Bible, the, uh, the word harmony was used instead of unity. Mm. And I, I was thinking that oftentimes we're told to sing in unison. Right. We all sing the same note. But when we sing in harmony, we sing the same words, but we put a different blend to it. Nice. We, we put a, a, another flavor to it, mm. and we, we all sing a different, maybe a different note. But it makes beautiful music. So not everybody is the same. They may have a different note, but the music they make is, is pleasing and uh, a harmony together. So maybe we do sing in unison. We're, we're to live in unity, yeah. but in harmony. Nice. Well said, Rabbi. So you can see. Um, the generational uh, righteousness that Julia comes from. How does a Jewish collar work? Because I haven't seen a lot of Jewish collars. Yeah. So the word translated collar is also translated extremity or edge. So there's some debate as to which it is. Uh, I certainly would favour edge because the oil doesn't stop at your collar. Um, trust me. <laughs> I tried it this week, and the visual that we have is going to show you what I went through when I tried it. Uh, but the oil, in fact, makes its way all the way down to your toes, and it certainly doesn't stop at your collar. But the word you're referring to also means extremity, or at the very edge of the garment. Yeah, good question. Thank you. And lovely observation. Errol. Uh, some of the early uh, English translations, and I understand that the German ones as well, uh, say that the oil ran down the robes of Aaron. Nice. Yeah, absolutely right. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because if we read the scriptures, and certainly we read Exodus and other parts of the Torah, we see that Aaron has robes. He has a linen undergarment, and he has an outer blue uh, robe that goes over that 
And so Errol um, points out well that that is the case, that the oil covered every part of his attire. Let's take a look at the visual. Okay, I had to throw out the shirt I was wearing because I couldn't wash the oil out of it. Interesting. Right. Interesting, yeah. I couldn't wash the oil out of it. I had to throw out the shirt. So that interests me. It stung like hell. It burned my eyes. I was in pain. I don't know the science of it, I'm just, uh, what I want you guys to do is hear what I'm saying and say to yourself, what, what figurative meaning is there in this? What does oil represent for us? What does the idea that that oil which represents such and such might sting my eyes, how, how does that speak to me? The fact that my sh I couldn't get the oil out of my shirt, how does that speak to me? The fact that it ran all the way down to my toes, how does that speak to me? These are all things that this image is meant to get you to think about. The psalmist is, is using this image to teach you something spiritual, right? And something that actually is both locational and within time and space and transcends time and space. You know, all those things that it occurred. Look, I expected it to be enjoyable. I really did. I, I thought, hey, um, I'm going to pour this oil over me. It smells pretty good. It's just going to flow all down over me all in one place. And it's going to feel nice and smooth and... That was not the experience I had at all. And it, it wasn't the experience Aaron had either. I guarantee you it stung his eyes. I guarantee you that it probably really soaked into those garments and I suspect that whatever washing process they used, it was never entirely removed from his garments. What is that saying, guys? Just to give you guys uh, another idea, see this horn, okay? So, not this particular horn, but one like it, but without the end cut off, without a hole for blowing it with, okay? So picture the end without the hole in it, it would still just have the hard part of the horn there, and then filled up with oil, filled up, and then tipped over Aaron. And some of the horns were much bigger than this. So we're not talking about anointing with oil, little, little drop of oil. That's not how this worked. It was like this. And it went everywhere and all over. Um, I was just thinking that the first verse says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then compares it with this oil being pulled down on the head, and how does that feel pleasant? You, you just explained to us it didn't feel pleasant in its stance, so how is that? Does, does That's a great question. That's a great question. So it begins, it begins with that simile, and then in a very traditional Jewish poetic way, it doubles up, if you like, 
the concepts. So Hebrew poetry uh, is written often in couplets, where in modern English poetry, rhyming is part of it and rhythm and so on. In Hebrew, Hebrew poetry, we use couplets, so similar ideas doubled up to convey a message. So we start with, as you rightly say, we start with the simile with regard to the anointing of Aaron, part of which involves stinging eyes and various other things. But then we have a similar idea where something is running down onto the mountains of Israel. But this time it's water, right? So water doesn't sting. So you ask a great question. What journey is it that we're being taken on through those similes that is revealing the pleasantness and goodness of brothers and sisters dwelling together? So when we look at it like that, really what we see is the end from the beginning, is that we see the outcome, then we hear the simile and receive the outcome again. Some of you guys are going, this is just not logical. It's, it's Hebrew. Okay? It doesn't have to be logical. I'll tell you why. I think it is logical. But it doesn't have to be logical because logia is a Greek word. We're Hebrews. Okay? So we don't need your Greek logia. We have a different way of thinking. Rabbi? Yeah, back on the that will. The will. My vision says harmony is as precious as the anointing will. And I was thinking the will is not just what I use. Over there, and what even that? It went through a real process, didn't it? Nice. Um, what you are purified to be used for that? So Ra- yeah. Rachel, I'm glad you brought that up. Precious. We're going to take. Hang on. We're going to take some time with Rachel. She reminded us that it's precious. It's not just cooking oil from the kitchen. In fact, the Hebrew calls it hatov, the good. You know, good in if we it's not like good in English. Oh, that was a good one, bro. Oh, that's a, a good um, TV you've got there. Oh, that's, that's pretty good, what you just did. English is very generic with good. Yeshua said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You see, to the Hebrew, good is a much more sacred word than the way we use it. And actually, good is also translated precious. The oil, the precious. And this was sacred oil. God goes so far as to say, in this mixture with all these elements to it, cassia, cinnamon, myrrh, uh, a sweet reed, which we don't know what it is. So it's actually impossible to make this oil anymore because one of the components, we don't even know what it is. Olive oil, all mixed together, this mixture in the way that I've laid it out is sacred. It is only to be used for the anointing of the priests and for sacred use. Anyone who uses it for mundane things is to be cut off from Israel. That means put to death. This is not just oil. This is sacred, precious Good in the ultimate sense, oil. Expense is very important because, I mean, if you had to go with me to buy myrrh yesterday, you would have coughed up a lung. Um, It's also expensive to make. Now, uh, the Hebrews, the Jews did bring this stuff with them out of Egypt because, in fact, we know that the Egyptians were happy to give them things. Some of them because they wanted to get rid of them. Some of them because they respected them and their God and wanted to give toward that. But we had these things with us. We brought them out. But let's keep in mind, things like myrrh are not easy to produce. And they are expensive. You know, this bottle of myrrh, this tiny little bottle of myrrh, cost me $42. It's still Yeah. You know, we like to think that when we're dealing with the Spirit of God, it's all about nice stuff, right? But you know what? I'm okay with the Holy Spirit stinging my eyes. See, because I see with human vision, with a fallen nature. So if the Holy Spirit wants to sting that out of my eyes so that I can see the unseen things of Him, 
I'm okay with that. Are you? It's going to hurt. Are you okay with that? This is what it means to be a Messiah follower. It's going to hurt. It's not all going to be blessing. It's ludicrous to say that you'll always be blessed. Yeshua said, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have trouble. Those who want to be followers of Messiah must walk as Messiah did. You know what? Yeshayahu calls him a man of sorrow. Acquainted with affliction. This is what it means to walk with the Messiah. Yes, and blessing. But not blessing alone. And sometimes blessing appears to be curse. But it's in fact blessing. Okay, this is another thing we've got to get our heads around. And it's very important. So I actually, I didn't enjoy the experience, but I enjoyed the result. Because the result actually challenged me to say, well, maybe my eyes do need stinging. Maybe some of the things I'm looking at need to be blocked by the oil of the Holy Spirit. You know, so I think it's worth considering that reality. Okay, so we're going to do the, the smell. Now, I just want to put you at ease. Those of you who are Bible scholars will know that the text says you're to do 500 shekels of this, uh, half as much of this, 500 shekels of this. It names all the elements. And then it says anyone who uses this for any other purpose will be cut off. Okay, so you guys are now freaking out a little bit. Yaakov's going to mix this stuff up and it's going to be like Indiana Jones Ark of the Covenant time and we're all going to get decimated. There's two reasons that won't happen tonight. One is, one of the elements we have no idea what it is, just that it's a sweet cane. It probably grew uh, like in the Nile or parts of Africa, but we don't know what it is. I don't have that element with me, so we're already not making the exact oil. Secondly, I don't have any cassia with me, so we're missing two elements. What I do have may or may not be like what they had, but what I want to do is mix what I do have for you. Not because we're trying to emulate that oil, but because I want you to smell it. Because there's as much connection to who the Spirit of God is by way of character and presence in the smell as there is in the texture of oil. The fragrance of this mixture speaks to us also about the Spirit of God and His anointing. So we're going to do that. We're going to put it into this Havdalah uh, Samim. Uh, it's a... Uh, mixed spice holder and you take the top off and you you smell it okay so i'm going to put it in here and we're going to pass it around and i'm going to say a baha over it because jews have a blessing for everything so you know if you want a jewish perspective this is what you're getting right this olive oil that i have is all the way from shomron does anyone know what shomron translates to Okay, it's Samaria. We have this olive oil because we support, and I'm going to do a plug for them, and entirely unashamedly, we support a group called Lev HaOlam as a family. Lev HaOlam, you give them money each month, and they send you products from Judea and Samaria. And so we're supporting those Jews who are living in Judea and Samaria. So that's where this comes from. And I've got other products at home. They send you awesome dates. Oh, the stuff is phenomenal. It, it's just delicious. And all sorts of a variety of things. Julia got this awesome necklace and all sorts of things. But what's cool about it is you're funding businesses and Jewish communities living in Judea and Samaria. Why is that so important? Well, does anyone know what the world calls those locations? The world calls those locations by the deluded term occupied territory. Why do I say deluded? Because it's not occupied territory, it is the land of Israel. Okay? 
So that's why I'm promoting this. Anyway, the, you're going to be smelling oil from the land. Baruch Hashem. Okay, and then we've got some cinnamon sticks here. If you watched my promo online, you would have seen me using it to look like a cigar. My wife was not impressed. And then I've got this myrrh. I'm not going to put too much in there because it's like flipping liquid gold. So myrrh comes from a tree. Um, and it's in the same family as the tree we get frankincense from. And cinnamon and cassia are both from the same family as well. Okay, so I'm going to ask Rabbi Steve to come and take this around. And if you'd just like to go with it, give it to people and they can lift off the lid. We're just going to say a bracha. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei minei vesamim. All blessing comes from you, O Lord, our God, King of the Universe. Um who gives us the various spices, okay? So that's essentially what we're saying. I'm just going to have a whiff first. Hmm. quite citrusy. You can smell and then pass it on. So we're going to get you guys just to have a... I just want you to engage with the smells and see what you think. Remember, we don't have all the ingredients, okay? We're missing two of them. You're not going to drop dead. You guys are smelling that. I'd just like to start doing a bit of a read through each verse and then just unlocking some of the doors to the side rooms of this psalm because there's a lot going on and it might seem like just a short little psalm, but it's actually full. It's a little bit like Narnia. This psalm is a little bit like the closet, you open the closet, you start walking through it, and all of a sudden you realise it's much more than just three verses. Okay? David is the attributed author. Okay, so that brings then to mind, what was it David saw or observed that caused him to write this psalm, do you think? He obviously saw brothers dwelling together in unity in Israel. Where, would he have, where and when would he have seen that happen? I'm not looking for an exact time in history, I'm just speaking in general. I was thinking of two occasions, I was just reading this morning when I was preparing um, the Levites for the temple service. Yes. So putting them in order in their houses and their responsibilities. I was just thinking about the time he was, he would have been anointed with that, but when he would experience yeah, when he was anointed as king. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, cool. I guess he's got the same concept of it. I like that too. That's yeah. cool. We don't know when he wrote it. You know, it occurs to me that Israel as a people were in unity at least three times a year, every year. You know what I'm talking about? Is the Aliyot, the Regalim, the going up festivals. Okay? So Passover. Yom Kippur, Sukkot. So it occurs to me that it may have been during one of these times that he looks down. In fact, he's there participating with them. That he looks upon Israel dwelling together. Whereabouts? On Mount Sion. The Jew of Hermon comes on to the mountains of Sion. And what he saw, he saw... But I think he also saw it forward as well into the future. That he was seeing something that had much more to it than just the actual physical sight of brothers dwelling together in unity. Because Israel certainly didn't stay together in unity. The kingdom was divided. There was great disunity. So let me read the first verse to you again. And then we're just going to talk a little bit about it. Shir. A song, hama'alot, of that which goes up, that which comes to mind, degrees, stairs, ascents. Le David, attributed to David, the beloved of God. Hine, behold, now, pay attention, ma. Okay, most of the Bibles we read tonight said how. 
But you know, most commonly in Ivrit, ma means what? Not how, but what? Can it mean how? Yes, but much less often. So in fact, what is probably the better translation? So we might say, behold, what is this that's happening here? That's the kind of meaning that the Hebrew is offering. Okay, it's, it's a subtle difference, but I think it kind of lends itself to give us a better perspective of what's actually been said. What good, umanayim, and what delightfulness, what pleasantness, so if we meet someone and, and we're enjoying meeting them, we we'll say, Naim Meod. Naim Meod. It's pleasant, very pleasant to meet you. Naim Meod. Shevet. Sitting, dwelling, remaining, abiding. Achim. Not just brothers. Achim, it's a plural word. For a brother, we say, Ach. For a sister, achot. For a brother and sister, or brothers and sisters, we say, achim. So we can do away with our patriarchal translation and say brothers and sisters, because that's what the Hebrew says. Achim. When brothers and sisters, gam yachad. Gam is also, again. So not just dwelling in union, but again. In union. Gam, also, yachad. Now, yachad, it doesn't mean one, like echad, but it means union. Yachad's related to the word echad, which means one, but it's not the same as. And what it means is a union, and it's not the same as, for example, it's not the union of husband and wife. So Genesis would say, the two became... Echad, one. But we're reading Yachad. So this is two side by side, not two intimately connected. Okay? So there's a difference. So some of the ways we can translate Yachad, united, in union, alike. We could say as one, but not in the same sense as husband and wife. Another way to read the opening part of the psalm might be like this. A song of the ascending of David. Look now, what is this good? And what is this loveliness? It is brothers and sisters sitting together also or again in union, unity. Quite different, eh? It just changes the dynamic somewhat. And we don't, we don't really get that from most of the English translations. I find the Targum interesting. The Targum is an Aramaic version of the scriptures, of the Psalms in this case, written in the second century by non-Messianic Jews. And they, their first verse of the Psalm reads this way. A song that was uttered on the ascents of the abyss. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is dwell at the dwelling of Zion and Jerusalem, together indeed like two brothers. So they've actually taken the simile really from the end of the psalm and infused it with the first verse of the psalm. I'm not saying this is the scripture, I'm just saying it's interesting the way they viewed it. A number of Christians have used this psalm around me or have wanted me to use it in a similar way by saying to me things like, look, if we can just get the brothers and sisters, the church, the ecclesia, the body of believers to dwell together, then the Lord will command the blessing. That instantly takes the entire psalm out of context and usurps the original <laughs> receivers of the psalm and misunderstands it quite completely. Because what does the text say? Does the text say, 
that wherever in the world brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, there God will command a blessing? What does it actually say? What does it actually say? Where does God command the blessing? This is the question, Rabbi. It says on its own. Right. We know where it's being commanded. We know which people it's being commanded over because the poet refers to the high priest, Aaron, a Jew, the spiritual head over the Jewish people. We know where on earth it's commanded, on the mountains of Zion. So actually, yes, God does command the blessing when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. But he's not going to command it where you are. The scripture says he commands it on the mountains of Zion. When and where? Well, when and where Israel, ethnic, religious, dwell together in unity. I can tell you right now, we don't at the present time in history. So therefore, he saw it past, but he also saw it future, didn't he? Okay, verse 2, let's take a look. Kashemin. So shemin is oil or the fatness of the land. In this case, it's oil, shemin. And actually, it says so on this, this oil. It says shemin. So it's oil. But the prefix before it is from the Hebrew word ki. It means because, as. And you could say like. But again, I think because is the better, better translation. So we've been reading these things as similes, and that's fine. But now if just take a moment to think about what if it's saying because of the oil flowing down the beard of Aaron. And because of or as the dew of Hermon coming and falling on the mountains of Sion. Because it's not the same as like, is it? It actually makes the similes a mechanism for the unity. You understand what I'm saying? It makes the similes a mechanism for the unity. It actually means the unity can't happen unless certain other things fall into place. Okay, there's a shift here. So... I'm saying it's valid to say like, but the Hebrew can as well be translated to say because. So this unity has to be achieved somehow, as Errol rightly said. We obviously don't know how to achieve it, do we, Errol? Because we haven't yet. As you rightly said, we have not. It's not conformity. No, it's not conformity. And in that sense, look, the paraphrase with harmony is fine. The message is sound. The thing is that what we're seeing here then is that unity is actually largely reliant on a point yet future. Because the unity being spoken of here is between Jews, brothers and sisters, who came from wandering in the desert where Aaron was anointed once only. Once he was not anointed again, once he was anointed to be high priest. So this isn't just we anoint you with oil. This is a one-off. He didn't keep getting anointed with oil all the time. You understand why that's important? Does it maybe, if you think about oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, does it maybe make you think forward in history to a point where, well, a whole group of Jews got anointed by the Holy Spirit, a singular event, and 3,000 Jews came to faith and reaped the benefit of that same anointing. Singular events happening throughout history. Okay, so it's a single event. Now, he is the priest, the high priest of the Levitical priesthood of Israel. 
But his priesthood was taken by our Messiah and united to the kingship of Israel and enveloped with a priesthood that pre-existed it. Or rather a type that pre-existed it. The priesthood of Melchizedek, my king of righteousness. An eternal priesthood. One where the high priest didn't need to keep make, making offerings. So where the high priest Aaron received the oil that was meant to have an effect on the unity of his people, Israel, Yeshua was able to pass on an anointing that had an effect not only the people of Israel, but on all believers. However, the key still seems to be Jewish believers coming together, and not just around the world, but in a specific location. So it's as the Jew of Hermon falling on or running down the mountains of Sion. Does anyone know the geography of Israel? How close is Hermon to the mountains of Sion? I mean, it's not right next door. Hermon is in the north, close to Lebanon. The mountains of Sion are down further. So this dew is precipitating from the north, coming and coming down on the mountains of Sion, right? So we've got oil, the Ruach HaKodesh, water, Maim Chaim, water of life. We've got Sion. We've got Israel from the north to the collective center. When are we in the center? Three times a year for the Aliyot festivals. It means the reinstitution of the Aliyot festivals. It means a temple. It means so many things in place. And it's actually, whilst we can apply the principle to us dwelling in unity, so there's a principle here that if we dwell in unity as the oil running down Aaron, that means if, as Errol says, we are filled with the Holy Spirit as believers and we share the same Spirit, then there's a principle at work that we will see a greater amount of unity. But unity isn't the goal. Yeshua is the goal. Unity is the fruit of the outpouring of the Spirit that Yeshua gives us. We didn't receive the Spirit till Yeshua was with the Father. So the Spirit we receive is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. It's what the New Testament teaches. So we can see in principle a unity born of this. But ultimately this psalm points to something yet future. And the sign of it will be Israel, the ethnic religious Jewish people, together in the mountains of Sion, and in particular Mount Sion, where they will see the outworking, they'll be redeemed through the Mashiach, they will receive the same Holy Spirit, and it's there that God will command the blessing, ultimately. Now we can see that in principle, but we cannot see it in actual fulfilled reality until the latter days when this happens. So we always have to keep that intention. If we're going to apply the principle, fine, as long as we acknowledge that there's a very specific thing going on here, that this is intended for the ethnic religious people of Israel. And when we Jews see the one whom we have pierced and grieve as for an only son and receive him and are filled with the Holy Spirit, yes, as Errol says, we will truly be one, with our Gentile brothers as well. I'm not excluding Gentiles. I'm just saying there's a process. We've talked about unity a lot over the years as a group of believers. But you know, a guy named Benjamin came from a Messianic Jewish community in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem uh, last year. And he said, you know, I hear a lot of talk from Gentile Christians from around the world about unity. But they don't seem to understand that there's a protocol to unity. They've come to us and told us we need to be one with them. But they haven't come to us and said, we respect you as the older brother. 
And we want to humbly come to you and say, will you take that position in the community of faith as the older brother? Because we have kind of usurped it from you. But he, what he said was that when the Gentile church is willing to humbly come to her older brother and say, we appreciate the position God's given you, that the mechanism for this kind of unity that we hope for will begin to play out. But that only happens when you're focused on Yeshua. Because he understood what humility looked like. He was the servant Messiah. I come to serve, not, not to be served. But I think this psalm is, is triggering that kind of idea for us. That we, that needs to be what we're looking to. No one's saying that Jews are more important than Gentiles. What we're saying is the same as what we say when we see a family with three brothers. The older brother is not loved more than the youngest brother, but he plays a different role. And that's simply all we're saying. Okay, we are, we have equity in Messiah. We are one in that sense, but we all have our own roles to play.